want to talk about City and Eastern songs today? Well, it's an album that was recorded a, uh, a long time ago. It was 2005 when it was recorded, which seems ancient. Um, and ancient both for culture and music and also ancient for the fact of like how much younger I was and how, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of things I would, I would do differently now both for the, the writing and the recording and everything, but that's just, that's just natural. But at the time when you did the recording, this was like a big step up, right? This was the first, oh, yeah. this was the first with Kramer? Or was it was a tremendous uh, change from uh, making these really super cheap, dodgy, homemade recordings. It was the first time we were in a real recording studio, even though it was only six or seven days in the recording studio, which was in Tribeca, pretty close to uh, where the Knitting Factory was on Leonard Street. Um, and yeah, with Kramer as producer and with um, Dave Gerby as engineer. And it was all completely new to it, even though I'd been playing with my brother Jack since, since we first started making up songs, which was like 97, 98. Um, and our drummer Dave had been with us um, about a year at that point. So we've been making music for, you know, five, six, seven years. Not that you would know it from listening to us, but um, we had never done a recording studio thing. It seemed like a huge deal to us at the time. It seemed outrageously expensive, you know. Well, I remember, I thought that, I, I think I, I, this album is actually the one where I met you when you were touring on this album, I think, right, in Boston. I think that was this album. Is that right? Was that, if it was 2006, yeah, although in those days, it things would come out in, uh, it was, there was a huge staggered difference between the UK release and Europe and the US. The album came out like a year later in the U.S. than it did, in the, a whole year removed. I feel like it was 2005, uh, that's what's weird. But, um, so I mean, 2005, I mean the album didn't come out in the States until 2006, um, and nobody does that nowadays, I guess. But at the time it certainly made touring easier, because you, you would come out in one country, you could tour there, and then you know, at some point, a few months later, or in this case the next year, it would come out in another country, and then you could tour there. So. But I was going to say, just coming out of like punk and playing with you at like a house show and then you went made a record with Kramer I was also like whoa this is like a big deal and it's, well Kramer it's was funny, a really you know. big deal to myself and my brother Jack um, cause you know we wor totally worship those uh, I mean I'll pull out a couple of things now well, um, you know the, the Daniel Johnston records that he made uh, and the uh, of course Galaxy 500 and, oh actually and all the Bong Water records are you know yeah um well, for 1990? Yeah, uh, 1990 and Artistic Vice, but I actually, I, I, I rearranged my, uh, I did rearrange the indie rock part of the record, so there's only, uh, only Strawberry Alarm Clock records where the Daniel Johnson records once were. Um, I think the indie rock is all in, in my room. But yeah, those, those records, Artistic Vice and 1990, were both uh, just devastatingly good records, and Daniel Johnston as one of the, you know, the most important artists that I, you know, the that just made such a huge impact on me. And those two records, when I heard those, were both like not only tremendously impactful records to me in totally different ways, because 1990 is really stripped down and raw. Yep. Um, and then Artistic Vice was kind of the best produced record he had ever made. It was prior to the, the uh, Atlantic Fun album. Bottle Surfer for the uh, uh, Paul Leary one. Yeah, which I love also. Yeah. But yeah, those two, and also 1990 is incredibly depressing and dark. And then Artistic Vice is like super happy and upbeat. So those two records really go well. You know, I had them, obviously I like taped them on both sides of one cassette. Like they just went together very well. Um, and Kramer was the producer on both of those albums. Um, and Kramer was just like a legend to myself and, yeah. and my brother Jack. And Galaxy 500, of course we loved that stuff. Um, and my favorite Low album was the one that Kramer produced, like the, early, the earliest Low oh, stuff. And he was involved in Ween. Uh, we, you know, we were total worshippers of Ween. So it was just for us. It was like if you if we listed our dream producers, uh, you know, Brian Eno, uh, Dr. Dre, who, you know, you, you make a list of like who would be the top producers, and Kramer would be in there, and Kramer would be the only one that was just like accessible. You know, he's because right. I mean anybody could basically he's for hire. You just go and uh, you know look him up and. Pay him and he'll make a record with you. 
I mean, yeah. basically like Steve Albini too. They're just yeah. working guy. You know, they working guys. The next time they have an available window, they'll slot you in and do the work with you. It's just a you know, it's a job for them. Yeah. No, it is funny to think though. Again, how big of a deal that felt like, you know back then and then it was like now you go to the studio for every every record <laughs> this, yeah, be now, going to like, this was the record where you went yeah, to the studio yeah, for the you know absolutely the, I mean and it was partially just uh, changing technology because I didn't have any friends that had a studio at that point you know at now it's like I have friends that have recording studios but I you know at that time I had friends that had home recording setups major Matt Mason uh Spencer Chiquitas, who's a Balloon Heaven studio I'd done a bunch of recordings in, which was a big step up from just recording on cassette myself. You know, he had Pro Tools in his living room and mics. I'm glad you mentioned Olive, olive Juice, right? Is that, uh, because that's a good segue into um, Williamsburg, Will Oldham Horror. Oh, right. Major where Matt you Matt reference going, yeah, to going to Major Matt's. Major too. Matt's. I guess I wanted to get into the weeds. Um, some factor. I, I just had some like factor fiction you know, questions for the... For the for the YouTube audience about especially about that song we can go into the record but um I guess that's the first question what record were you remastering at that time because this is only your third record uh yeah was that not real is that just part of I the song think... or were you actually you know how real no is that it, song? that well that would have been factual because it doesn't even rhyme there was no other reason to say that it was only because I would have been yeah taking the L train back and forth and you know Major Matt's uh, Olive Juice home studio where I did do a lot of recordings was on Suffolk Street, um, sort of just on the Manhattan side of the Williamsburg Bridge, essentially, and, um, or off, of, off, yeah, he was like sort of between Houston and Delancey in, in that region, and a lot of recordings and work was done there. Most of the 12 Crass Songs record was recorded there, and I think I was probably some old tape record. I was probably putting out a collection of like old home cassette recordings that I was having him master. Tapes from the crypt. Yeah, I, I, so that, like I, because that, yeah. I, that probably what it was. And But I, I did a lot of work with Major Matt. I loved working with him, recording, mixing, mastering. No, I was just wondering, a song like that, especially like the, at the time it really felt like light years ahead of its time. It still kind of does, but I, one of the things about it is it just felt so, um, so earnest and honest, but at the same time it's still like poetry, it's art, you gotta rhyme shit, so that's what I'm, I'm kind of just wondering, like, wh how linear, how how realistic is that tale, or is that more metaphor cobbled together, like, did you see Will Oldham at the Bowery Ballroom, and, um, you know? Well, I saw Will Oldham, yeah, the gig that I was talking about, or, you know, I'd seen Will Oldham do a gig at the Bowery Ballroom, and he was wearing, you know, sunglasses, which, uh, somehow was such a weird juxtaposition for me because of his, his role as a this kind of, um, you know, the, the cracked vulnerability of his voice and his kind of outsider -y aesthetic combined with him on stage in a sort of rock star persona, you know, being like a cool guy in sunglasses, was just another example to me of his, like, very strange place in culture, which I found disturbing and... Um, which is part of the point, I think, of part of what was so powerful about him as an artistic persona was that he kind of disturbed and disrupted a lot of what you expected an artist to do. And he was constantly surprising. He changed his name with every release. That was, you know, when I wrote the Williamsburg Will Oldham Horror song in 2003, um, he had just started using the Bonnie Prince Billy name, and it was not clear at that time that he would stay with that name. Right. For until the present day, it was just one more name that he had used because he had been Will Oldham for the Joya record. He had been Palace, 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 Palace Brothers, Brothers, but you know, Arise Therefore had no name on it, um, and I was really sort of grappling with uh, the fact that he had this huge impact on culture, which I think is something about that song that people don't really. It you know, it's something that the song is very dated in a certain way because nowadays if I you know if people talk about Will Oldham he's kind of in an esoteric underground right. uh, you know he's he is kind of now in the same sort of marginal position that uh, maybe somebody like uh, I don't know Juju or what if I'm pronouncing him right or some, yeah. you know, or uh, you know somebody who's like if you're in the know you would be hip to this person 
but he's gone in an opposite direction from, say, Bill Callahan or, uh, you know, Sufjan Stevens or these uh, right, Devendra Banhart, like, yeah. people that have, you know, got bigger and bigger after he was at, you know, sort of in the next generation after um, Will Oldham's ascendancy. And Will is kind of like, um, purposefully, it seems to me, you know, positioned himself increasingly obscurely rather than be a careerist about it. Not not just Will, but but I feel like that whole song kind of captures this like late '90s, early 2000s New York, right? Like in this way, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't really, yeah, right. I think you're riding the L train, like, and maybe that's just growing up in that era too. It doesn't feel the same as like riding the L train now. This idea of just going to some guy's studio, but it's now it's in Tribeca. You know, it's like it, it's it's not. Um, yeah, it captures would, this feel of like the, but the late. It was 90s, a place on a time. Yeah, it it was definitely. Uh, something that doesn't... You know, everything is always in constant flux. I mean, if right now, if I wrote a song about, you know, walking around in Bed-Stuy and, uh, you know, is that a Mac DeMarco walking down the street or something, you know, whatever the cultural touchstones um, and the, the locations where the young people are, are hanging out... Um, and the struggling, where you know, where the struggling artists are in comparison to the successful artists, and the aspiration to become like the successful artist, um, it would just be a different place and a different artist and a different, even a different culture. I mean, you know, things are the youth is different nowadays. And I was, you know, twenty six at that time, um, and uh, yeah, but I did take a ride on the L train. And see some dude who looked like Will Oldham, wearing sunglasses, and uh, maybe it was him. I don't know. You never found out if it was him. No, I didn't. didn't but that know, happened. It was just it just like made me think of the first line of the song, and I took out. Um, I happened to have like a a bank statement in my pocket, so I just started write. I I wrote down. Um, Today I went to Major Matt's to remaster my old album, and on the L train in the morning, I was pretty sure I saw Will Oldham, uh, which doesn't even rhyme. Um, he was wearing the same sunglasses he had on stage at the Bowery Ballroom, uh, and yeah, it was it was um, a way that a lot of songs actually, you know, I would just sort of start thinking of something, and then you'd find desperately find some scrap of paper yeah. and start. Writing it down, and in this case, I, you know, I don't know if you can, so I, you know, I just kept writing and writing all over this uh, bank statement, and then by the time I just had to keep sort of stopping and coming up with some other line, and the story just kind of developed, and then by the time I got to my girlfriend's apartment in Greenpoint, I had like nine nine percent of it written, and I just picked up the guitar and like the first, you know, like I just needed a couple of chords, two, three, four chords, didn't matter. So you really, um, so you really saw this guy on the train that looked like Will and was just like, or was it something like a few days later you like recollected this? Re I think it was just right and, there. I just started the, the first line and it, certain songs do uh, like Latch uh, said, sometimes the songs just write themselves and that, because you just realize like how much you have to say about a certain thing all it takes is like the thing you're like right. oh I can talk about this and I can talk more and more and more about this and it, there's just a lot to unpack um, so yeah it's definitely the longest song on the record um, well that too again the older we are and the more like I've seen and that you've done it doesn't feel that that like long anymore but I remember at the time it was this is the longest song anyone's ever you know like a punk like a guy well, just wrote a seven minute or six minute song like it felt and now it, it doesn't feel like that anymore but at the time that was also part of it you went to Kramer you had this like long song which was the kind of thing maybe bands in the 60s or 70s did you know there was a lot it, you know yeah I, I always think of it as like uh, it's my Alice's restaurant yeah that, that's uh, what I'm saying it was something like that it was like wow this is this yeah uh, I just didn't see that kind of thing though outside of you know like but in some ways, it's almost an amateurish thing to do, like, you know, for uh, a young songwriter to uh, be like, well, I can just write a lot of words. It's, it's like as if length in itself equals uh, substance. Uh, so that's, you know, I feel like the tendency to want to write, you know, like a Dylan-esque right. thing to be like under the sway of like, oh, you know, Bob Dylan is like, you know, the king of singer-songwriters, so 
and he would write these long shaggy dog stories so that's you know so there's definitely a bit of that in there but it was also it certainly wasn't my intention to write a long song it just there just kept being more that I wanted to say. You have all that stuff about like 60s um, kind of rock and embedded in there, right? You referenced Dylan and the Stones. Like, where did, where did, oh, well, where, how did that, like, where did that come into that narrative with the Will Old? Well, I wanted to show you stuff? this, uh, you know, another thing in the, in the writing of that song that I wanted to show you. Just recently, um, maybe about a year ago, I plucked this book off my shelf uh, in the Fascist Bathroom by Grail Marcus, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, and when I flipped it open, I weirdly suddenly realized that part of the Will Oldham song uh, was inspired by this book because the very first uh, the very first chapter, the very first page of the first chapter, he's talk is a review that Marcus wrote of the Rolling Stones' Let It Bleed album when it first came out at the end of 1969. Um, and he says right here on the first page, um, it's a long way from get off my cloud to give me shelter from I can't get no satisfaction to you can't always get what you want. Um, and that's where I got that line, uh, you know, the Stones in 65 want total satisfaction, but, you know, by 1969 they see that there's grace and just, uh, just getting what you need. Um, and I totally forgot that I got that from this, that this, and, uh, this book is inscribed, uh, happy 22nd birthday, uh, inscribed to my brother Jack, who turned 22, it was, like, right around that time, it was late, uh, 2002, when he turned 22, um, so this book was given as a gift to my brother, and I must have just picked it open, you know, flipped it open to the first page, and, you know, it was uh, early 2003 that I wrote that song, so it was, um, you know, f I totally forgot that it came from, from uh, that idea that I stole from Grail Marcus on, on the first page of this book, until I picked this book up recently, you know, maybe about a year ago on the shelf, and I uh, was like, whoa, that's, that's where I got that idea from. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that song still, I think, is, like, that's kind of, the, I feel like that's the centerpiece of this record, but that's another thing, like, what gave you the idea to kind of not, you know, nothing on the back, and then you put all the track listing and UPC on the front? Was that just kind of a, you know, well, were I you just, going for something, or was it just kind of like... Um, you know, I was transitioning from doing my cassette recordings, for which I had always done these packaging, you know, fold-out comic books and stuff when I was making my own home cassette albums, and uh, making, do, having albums come out on Rough Trade on CD, I was, for the first couple albums, I was just like, how can I do this as cheap as possible? And then when I realized that people were still going to have to pay regular CD prices, it didn't matter how cheap the packaging was, right. they were still the same price in stores as every other CD. So this was the first album where I started experimenting with the packaging. And then I continued, you know, every album after this, I did much more elaborate packages with um, 12 craft songs and... Um, MRI was uh, actually supposed to be more elaborate than it ended up. It got quite a bit pared down. Manhattan has the big fold-out. Yeah. All of that stuff actually was... Um, let me... <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I won't fail when I attempt to find this other thing. Um, it in this one? Uh, yeah. For some reason, I have a sealed copy of this. Uh, yeah, well... Uh, Herman Dune a band that I was, uh, 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 that I, I am a big fan of, and, and was a big fan of, um, from France, and they were big fans of Will Oldham as well. Uh, this album, Not On Top, that Herman Dune did, which must have been, yeah, 2004, 2005, was when this came out, and uh, David Herman Dune did this artwork in here that uh, was this long fold-out, and it was a picture of the, uh, the Berlin... TV tower, and I kind of used the long vertical tower as part of this design, and then it had all the lyrics on the back. And th this just, I thought this was such a fantastic idea that I've basically ripped off of it in every CD package that well, I've done since the, then. The I'm thinking the doofus Oh, the doofus too, right? out. I'm like, this yeah. looks, you can see the inspiration. Um, I just had like no so idea that you could make a CD, you could do a fold out that long. Um, 
So, yeah, from, uh, from David Herman Dune, I ripped off the idea of doing this, like, long fold-out thing. But the, uh, uh, the, the cover, the flipping the cover around was just something where I was thinking about, um, you know, it is kind of annoying to have to do a CD package where you have, you know, in CDs you always have this, like, at right, that time, right. the jewel case uh, was this, like, stupid design element. So I was like, well, why, why does that have to be the front cover? Like, here, you have something more like an LP, where you have, like, an undisturbed, wider, you know, you've got more room there, and it's not uh, broken up by that annoying hinge. So I was like, that's going to be the cover, and then I'll just put all the information on the back. I'll put the UPC code and the copyright information and the, you know, the yeah. song titles. So my idea was that it should be stocked in stores like that, um, and, you know, then that would be the back cover. But somehow it just never ended up like that, you know, in uh, rough, if Rough Trade did like a, if anybody did a review of it, it, was, it that, yeah. they would show that as the front cover. So, and, you know, every time I put it on the merchandise table at a concert, if I put it up like that, people were always like, oh, that CD's flipped over by accident, you know, and they just like flip it over. So I'm like, all right, I guess this is the front cover. You just gave in. So eventually yeah. I just gave in and like realized like, this is the front cover. It's still kind of weird. I like the fact that it's weird that it has the UPC symbol and the other information on the front cover. Um, so there's a... Yeah, there's something interesting about that, although I, I will say that my later CD packages ended up... Um, I, I ended up doing much better... Having we much better packaging like ideas this. after that. We can leave it the way it was originally intended for the... So before we kind of finish, I've been harping on Williamsburg... Will Oldham, because that to me it just felt like the center. I had never heard anything like it. I remember I think I saw and I saw you play it live, and then we started, I don't know what we started talking about. Been out of shape. We started talking about some local bands, and that was it. Then, fifteen years later or whatever. But, but um, that's my when I look back at this record, and I just think of hearing that. But how about how about you? Like, what's what songs on there? Do you sort of and because there's so it's such a person. All your records are so personal, so I'm sure it's like got this time and a place element to it for you. But like when you look back at this one or when you think about it like well it was really for the development you know me like kind of learning how to play guitar a bit better and um it was a huge step up in musical quality for the band um just light years beyond what i had been doing with my brother jack just as bedroom recordings and a lot of that was down to uh drummer uh dave beauchamp who was um you know, had just joined, this was the first album that he had recorded on, and the uh, the skill in, in drumming, you know, he was by far the best musician in the band, um, and he really brought it to another level in terms of what we could do with rock songs. You know, we had always been like, you know, I would do my sort of acoustic folk songs, and then I would like rock out with Jack in a very kind of raw and punky way, and then we had our friend Anders playing drums with us for about a year and a half in there as well, maybe a couple of years with Anders. But he was more of like a jazz type drum. We were just like a weird mishmash yeah, yeah. with Anders, um, even though we, you know, he did a lot of great stuff with us. But Dave was like, in terms of being a rock drummer, it just escalated the, uh, the power of our, we finally sounded like a real band. So for me, you know, when I revisit these recordings, I hear how, you know, how still rough around the edges myself and my brother were, but the drumming, Dave's drumming is like, it sort of showed us, whether we realized it at the time or not, it was like, we are now like a better, we're like a real band now. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of the first time that that, at recording in a studio with a, you know, with a guy who really knows how to play drums in a real studio with an engineer, um, it was pretty different from the kind of Daniel Johnston home bedroom recordings that um, was pretty much my world for the first few years of making music. Um, and I thought, wow, like we're just getting better and better. At the, we're getting more fans, we're getting better at the band. Um, and, uh, you know, we're touring more and more. But looking back on it, I can really see how much uh, Dave, as a, entering the picture as a drummer, how much he was a big part of that escalation. We did a show open for the fall um, it was one of our first shows with drummer Dave um, around this era, and it was like we held our own as a rock band in the context of like opening up for the fall, 
at a rock club, and I was like, felt like, you know, felt to me like we were like an awesome rock band, and I was like, this is a new feeling. So that was, yeah, that, that, uh, um, and, yeah, I don't know, I guess I would just, just to, uh, the Will Oldham, Will, the, the Williamsburg Will Oldham Horror song, not, not to, like, just talk about that one, but I feel like I, I don't want, I, I'm worried that people take that song as, like, an insult to Will Oldham, because it's certainly nothing against him personally, I, I, you know, I think he's, you know, a, you know, a fantastic artist who actually had a big impact, a big influence on me as a songwriter and, and uh, a, a, as well as on other people. But, um, yeah, it was more just about the uh, aesthetic that he represented that I felt like I wanted to see indie rock. You know, indie rock to me was something very different than that. I was, you know, the, uh, the vulnerability and the power of um, expression that I, that, that you know, the, the sort of humbleness that I loved in, say, Sebado, Yola Tango, Daniel Johnston, that wasn't about being a cool rock guy wearing sunglasses. That was the contrast that I was like having problems with, that if this is supposed to be alternative music, like what, you know, that disturbance in the, these two kinds of different schools of what alternative music could mean to people. Um, and it wasn't just the sunglasses, I mean the sunglasses were just part, the whole aesthetic of royalty, uh, the royal stables, the uh, you know, Bonnie Prince Billy, his, uh, and in his lyrics as well, there was like this kind of uh, kill or be killed, you know, uh, aspiration to strength and, uh, you know, royalty and, uh, you know, this, this kind of um, hierarchical um, sense that uh, I want, I do want to write a whole essay about it someday. Cool. Well, no, I mean, this is, this is a great discussion. I think we could, we could talk more about that or all day. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, and you'll see in the in the uh, LP version that's coming out in August. I've also got, you know, I tried to reassemble the whole list of tour dates that uh, we were doing during this era, two thousand five, two thousand six, and it's kind of crazy to look back on. We were just touring so much. We were touring, uh, you know, we would do a tour opening up for Adam Green, and then we'd go right back to the same areas, you know, opening up for Squirty Politi, and then I'd go back again playing on my own, and then, you know, it was like, how many times can you play Chicago in one year? It was like, it was ridiculous, it was like, I was starting to become buddy-buddy with, like, the sound guy, the troubadour in L.A. or something, because most bands tour a place once a year, but I was doing so many support tours, starting really in that era, um, which kind of reached its pinnacle around 2008, when I was just, you know, uh, touring, a, oh, for some reason I was like, for, for a hot minute there, I was like, the support band of choice. Uh, which was great. It definitely got us a lot of new fans. But, um, yeah, it was just crazy to assemble all those tour dates to actually see what we were doing during the time when we recorded yeah, this yeah. album. And I was like, man, we were pretty busy. No, oh, it's cool to look at it. It's, it's, uh, I'm excited, you know, for that package to come out. It's, uh, it's got that, and it's got the a repli- a facsimile of the lyric sheet. Yeah, a nice uh, two-sided copy of the uh, of that Will Oldham lyric sheet, um, which may or may not be decipherable to read. My the scrawl that I wrote that's as I was that's as I was walking down though. Bedford Avenue, that's like the scrawling <laughs> one line after another. Um, and um, yeah, there's some bonus tracks from the Kramer sessions um, on there, and uh, it's all been remastered and kind of uh, in, improved to some degree. Um, and um, yeah, there's. Uh, there's there's some neat stuff. It's it's been long overdue. You know that record's never been on vinyl before, so I'm really excited to finally. Well, I know if you recall when I, when I met you in in 2005, and I was saying I would like a vinyl copy, and I'm like yeah, well, you know, and then however many years later, we finally we did finally. Well, you have to, to if it. you want something done right, you got to do it you yourself. Did, yeah, so now you've, yeah, now you've yeah, done it. Sometimes that's what it's so, like. Yeah. So I'm glad well, we finally made good on that agreement. And yeah. Well, years, the uh, the back later. cover is still the front cover somehow. Yeah. Well, cool.